Welcome back, sleepyheads, to another episode of Sleepy Aliens Perspective. I am your host, H. Lee. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for supporting me. Let's jump right into it. So today is my first deep dive episode, part one. And this uh, little mini-series is going to be about sex trafficking, information suppression, and communities. And I'm still like developing um, the scope of this because, you know, I just keep discovering new information and it just leads me down somewhere else. And I'm like, oh, I got to add that in here. So every time I thought I completed like the different parts that I broke up um, this report, I was like, I thought I was done, but then I realized I wasn't done yet. And It just took me in a whole new direction so yeah (laughs) but um what sparked my interest in this topic other than the lifetime movie that scarred me as a kid and i don't know if there's other women out there who was maybe just in the room with their mothers and or their grandparent or whomever and that person had a lifetime movie on and you would just sit there and you watched it and usually it's a topic that's important to women so maybe your mother or your grandmother let you watch that movie so that was completely my childhood um oftentimes my mom would be like doing my hair or you know i would have to like help prep dinner or something like that you know like um chucking corn or um you know, getting collard greens prepared or or any of those things. But yeah, so I would be in the living room and I would see all these movies and I grew to like those movies. And as I got older, I got used to like watching Lifetime movies still. And I have to say, in all honesty, I'm kind of, I'm pretty grateful for Lifetime because I watched movies about like, teens and STDs, um, dangerous like dating relationships and red flag things to look out for, um, just different uh, like what harassment was like I learned about all of that stuff through Lifetime movies. Oh my god, voyeurism like I remember gosh I watched that movie with my mom. I don't even remember it was what it was called. It was probably something basic like voyeur. <laughs> or like Boyer Next Door or something like that, you know. But um, yeah, I remember that movie really got to me. And oh man, like that is just... Oh, yeah, I don't get it. <laughs> There's just so many things I don't understand. Um, but yeah, so I learned a lot watching Lifetime movies and... I definitely, I can't remember what it was called, but I know I watched one about like, I watched multiple uh, films about abduction, but I know I watched at least a couple about sex trafficking. And then in high school, I think I did my first report on it. And then throughout college, I know I did a few papers about sex trafficking and other things applied to it. And honestly, it's just an issue that I care about a lot. My first job out of college, I worked at a youth shelter. Oh my gosh. One, I'll say in all honesty, I was not um, emotionally mature enough for that job. And I don't think I knew what I was getting into. I think I was just grateful that I had a job after spending four years of studying. And I wasn't even making that much money. I'm pretty sure like... After I worked at the youth shelter, you know, I needed something. Well, one, I needed a job, but I also, like, needed something that just wasn't so emotionally intensive. So I ended up working at a burger restaurant for a while. But it was exactly what I needed to, like, decompress from, like, the heavy shit that I, like, witnessed. And, like, it just taught me so much about what children in the system face and why they cycle in and out of the system and 
you know, maybe one day um, I'll do an episode about that. But I think it just hits home because a lot of the kids that stayed at the shelter, like they were CPS kids, um, there were runaways, and there were kids getting out of detention centers. So they would stay at the shelter for like months at a time. So I got to know these kids and, oh man, like, e, like I always, like, if I could, like, you know, adopt them and help them myself, I would, like, at that age, I, I would, I would have totally done it if I were, like, you know, a multimillionaire, you know, at that age, which would not have gone well, let's just be honest, that would have been a disaster, <laughs> oh, man, but, um, yeah, I, yeah, I grew to love a lot of those kids, and, the experiences just knowing the stuff that they were going through and knowing the degree to which you could help them was limited it was it's extremely difficult and like you know this shelter was like a no no touch shelter so you couldn't even hug these kids you know but it really did teach me that you can help somebody just by like you know, talking and like, you know, a lot can be done through like verbal healing. So yeah. And I, I, like one of the heaviest nights I think I had where I was like, like, holy shit, like this is just like this job. (laughs) Um, so I worked overnight shifts and I think they started at like 10 and then I would get off at like, I think it was like 4am or I can't remember 5am. It was some I think it was one of those. It was some crazy time. But um, right as my colleague was coming in for a shift change, I get a phone call from this kid who was on an overnight. And he's crying. And he tells me, can we come pick him up from where he is? And at the time, I didn't even drive. I biked everywhere. I, like, biked to work. Like, yeah. So I told him that I, like, couldn't come and get him, and I asked him, like, what happened, and, you know, he told me he got into a fight with his mom, and he just, like, couldn't be where he was, and um, I told him that I would let my colleague know, and, you know, we would see what we would do, and we'd try to call him back, and, you know, he just kept saying, like, please hurry, and so the next day, we all found out that he was involved he was just with some bad friends, you know, and it was his first overnight in a while, and he was involved in an armed robbery, and um, he wasn't even 18 yet, but he was sentenced to, like, uh, I can't even remember how many years it was, but he went to prison, and um, this kid still looked like a kid, And every time I think about that, my heart just clenches, you know, it's terrifying. Um, And he was a good kid. He was, he's smart and, you know, I hope he's doing okay. And, but yeah, there was just a lot of experiences like that. Like seeing, you know, teenage boys be shackled and be cuffed and like go to jail. And like, it's just, it, it was a lot. And so I would, I didn't realize at the time, but I was doing a lot to cope through all that. You know, I drink a lot more back then. Like, I don't drink very much now because there was a period of time where I didn't know that I had, like, a joint disease and and inflammatory issues. So, and I also didn't realize, you know, how alcohol impacts you spiritually. And, like, it just, uh, and also just hangovers at this age, you know. I'm 31 now, so hangovers just suck. But, um... Yeah, I just didn't um, connect all of those things at that time, you know. Um, shoot, I forgot where I was going with that. I was definitely rambling, probably. But um, a good sign for me to, like, uh, go back to whatever I was talking about before. But, um, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. So, yeah, I drink a lot. And I definitely went out a lot more at the time. And when I would get off from, like, those overnight shifts, I'd have to go running sometimes. And I don't think I... 
I think I had taken a, I was taking like, I don't think I was um, consistent with like seeing my counselor at the time. So I wasn't really processing all these things that I was having to, but we did get to like have a session with like a counselor at work, but that always felt like a low key performance review. So I didn't really feel very comfortable talking in those sessions because it's like, you don't want them to think that you can't handle your job. It's like, I can handle this, but this is heavy, you know, like, yeah, maybe give me some healthier coping mechani- mechanisms, you know? Um, but yeah, so that, that job was heavy and intense and I, ended up getting um, fired for being late. I was like made example and um, an example of being late. And I, I still struggle with that. I just like, it's, I think it's like some curse, but I am working on it and I'm getting better. And technically I am on time for work all the time. And I think the worst thing that I do is that I take my time <laughs> getting in my pod and like getting my apron on and like getting the register all set up like I just I go really slow and I'll be like oh I gotta go blow my nose real quick you know then I wash my hands and I just have really annoying morning allergies you know so it's just a lot and my body is literally allergic to being like just doesn't like going to work it doesn't like doing anything that it doesn't have a passion for, you know what I'm saying? But I try to make the most out of what I do at work and like, just, you know, chatting with coworkers and all that stuff. And, but yeah, see, I'm going off on another topic. Gosh, um, I'd apologize, but I'm not sorry. But anyway, so you know a little bit about why this is an important topic to me. You know, I do care about the wellness of children and I care about the future of this world. And, it's a huge issue that for some reason, like, you know, cops have to play this whack-a-mole game and it's endless and it's repetitive and it's something that's always frustrated me. So I've just, you know, studied in and out of this issue over the years and it's, I've thought about it so hard and for so long. Um, and this really doesn't even answer the question, but it does give us an honest direction of why this um, industry only continues to flourish despite technology and uh, law enforcement and uh, intelligence intelligence uh, agencies. You know, it just it doesn't make sense to me anymore sometimes. But um, yeah, I just want to say a few um, statistics I looked up. So in 2020, the FBI reported 5,400,000 people um, missing. Um, And of that, there were 3,400,000 of them uh, were children. And then also, um, if if you're thinking like, okay, that's uh, the reported cases. No. So the amount of children reported missing that year were 460,000 um, and of that 460,000 uh, 340,000 children were um, actually missing so um, it's crazy to me it's crazy to me because these children disappear without a trace no one ever sees them again and not only does it add to the mystery, but it just adds to the conspiracy, the hysteria, and the mistrust that we develop with our institutions sometimes, right? So it just makes me think about all that. And um, yeah, so we're going to dive into that. Um, and also, it says that like a child goes missing every 90 seconds. So every 90 seconds, the child goes missing. That's crazy. So I'm beginning this deep dive, focusing on the state of Oregon. Why Oregon? I live in Oregon. And since I've lived here, which has been, you know, not even two years, a little over a year and a half, I have had two um, incidents of women trying to lure me into sex work. Like, uh, like, just like 
I'll get into that in another part of this series, but it was it was weird and like you really have to be smart because like it's harder for these traffickers to procure their product, right? And they have to create these elaborate schemes now. And so it's just it's weird shit and a part of you might buy it at first because you know, like they tell you they have an opportunity for you and you know, you're like, great, but that's them like trying to build trust and see how susceptible you'll be to their direction. You know, it's it's crazy. But yeah, we'll get into that um, on another day. But I had an incident of that and I, you know, have also dealt with um, predatorial men when I, you know, went on a hike. And it wasn't me just being like alone in the woods. It was a really busy day and I was in Tillamook National Forest and people were swimming and I was walking along the trail where you can see the people swimming and they can see me but there happened to just be like areas of tall grass where you couldn't see me and like it was this old man and like um he said it was his grandson but I don't I don't fucking know it was just uh that's another story for another day we'll talk about hiking alone and uh being a woman and yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, but yeah, so currently Oregon has 16 task force dedicated to sex trafficking and it has 35 victim assistance centers throughout the state. Something to keep in mind. Uh, for the years 2018 to 2019, the Oregon Department of Justice and Homeland Security reported 746 human trafficking victims. Um, so there isn't a breakdown of how many of those victims were um, sex trafficking victims, but, you know, again, it does highlight that there's this is a state problem. That's a large amount. You know, those are a lot of souls, a lot of stories. Um, so for the year 2020, HumanTraffickingHotline.org reported a majority of human trafficking cases in Oregon were for sex trafficking, a majority um, of victims were females, and of those females, a majority of them were adults. So that kind of gives us a sense of maybe in the previous year, um, you know, the, the results, uh, those statistics were similar, but, you know, we can't say for sure, but it does give us some sense of, you know, what that breakdown uh, could have looked like. So Fox 12 News Oregon spoke with officials and the Portland Police Bureau for Human Trafficking, and um, they spoke with them April 19th, 2022. So, of course, this was very, very recent. And... Um, Officials in this bureau uh, reported to uh, news anchors that traffickers are becoming more bold and they're making moves in the daylight. So that alone says they're not only desperate, but the demand for the product and probably the price is even higher now. Um, And uh, yeah, so let's get into... uh, a few reasons as to why uh, these traffickers would become more desperate. Um, mm. Okay, I'm trying to keep this under 30 minutes. We'll see what I do, but I may have to like cut and like film another little part of it. Um, but yes, yeah, so traffickers are struggling to secure their product. So we have inflation, we have C19. We have less people spending money, less people going to public spaces, resorts, um, amusement parks, even regular parks in a sense, you know, I think it's taken, it's taking people a while to get like back to their um, physical, the physicality that they they had before um, the, uh, for C19, before C19 started. I don't even know if you can say that word on YouTube. But fuck it, fuck it, I said it, I said it. So yeah, and also there's more people staying at home. You know, I think we are creatures of conditioning, so people 
have now gotten used to getting their entertainment at home, doing their jobs at home, cooking from home, you know, and the cost effective benefits right now and it make that even more appealing for a lot of people. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, but yeah, so these are the typical spaces, those stereotypical spaces where traffickers in the past would succeed in securing their product. But even with those spaces not being as filled as before, it's even more difficult, even if it were, because there's more cameras and it's even harder for traffickers to escape vloggers, all those people taking selfies, family photos, you know, and I think people are also smarter, more alert, you know, I see more of those children on those um, leash things, you know, and it looks crazy, but if you think about the dangers in the world and if you think about you know, the little incidents that do happen in public spaces with children, I get it. If I were a parent, it's just a huge weight off the mind. I get it, but it it does look fucking crazy. So I don't know if I could personally do it, but it does look crazy. (laughs) Um, But yeah, so those are a few reasons, but I also want to touch on something else. So think about the fact that um, more women and more individuals are taking their sex work into their own hands and going on OnlyFans. And, you know, I have my issues spiritually with OnlyFans, and it's nothing like a holy Bible. It's more so like, um, you know, you have to be aware of the soul traps, you know, in this dimension. And in all areas of life, you know, all industries, there's going to be soul traps. And when it comes to sex work, you know, you really have to be careful because it's hard not to fall into traps, you know. They're huge and you can slip into them like that, you know. And like I said, it's in all industries. Like even a doctor, a doctor can be corrupt, you know, whether it's with a big pharma or the plastic surgeon who will load up, uh, you know, a woman's chest beyond a rational size, uh, you know, uh, it, yeah. So like I said, there's soul traps in all industries, but particularly with women and their empowerment in this dimension. And it's very, the soul, like, it's very shaky waters because you have to stay empowered in that field. And sometimes it can be hard to maintain that in those online spaces where the money comes quick, right? And we'll get into that another day. Um, But yeah, and if you don't know already, I ramble, I jump around from topic to topic. And I totally forgot what I was talking about. Oh yeah, so more women on OnlyFans. And so we have more women taking their sex work into their own hands. So if there's any woman out there right now who is still letting a man control her money or still has a pimp, please get an OnlyFans, you know? Invest in your wellness so that you can become, you know, a more high-paid escort or something. I don't know, that's just how my brain thinks. Like if I were going to choose prostitution as my career i would do it really well and i would make sure i was paid really well like i would try to excel (laughs) in that field but that's just how my brain works but yeah um but that's something to think about for uh women out there but like i was saying earlier this is a never ending game of whack-a-mole for police officers and that's with these traffickers and the predators out there right so this industry is a $150 billion industry and about, how much is it, $99 billion of that is allocated towards sex trafficking. $32 billion um, is estimated to go towards labor trafficking. But a $150 billion industry. I am going to pause this video and we're going to pick it right back up just because I don't want it to get too long. Don't hate me. We're going to start it again. Stay tuned. Thank you.